this is this is eighth grade um, U.S. history, just so you know. All right. Good afternoon, class. Um, just a reminder: next Tuesday, there's going to be a journal check, which we've been working on all semester. We should be like three fourths of the way through the semester, so we should have five or six by now. We make a little fee. They're going to be one-page write-ups about historical figures. You write about who they are, what they did, how it impacted history. So for those of you that need to catch up a little, our lecture on Harriet Beecher Stowe today would be a good one to consider writing about. Um, let's just said, yeah, next Tuesday, journal check. Um, we're finishing up Unit 14 about society this week, and next week we're going to get into pre-Civil War tensions. And so today we're going to spend a little time discussing Harriet Beecher Stowe. She is the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, the book discussing the evils of slavery. Um, so we're going to talk about her and how her writing affected pre-war tensions. And then we're going to start out with some new vocab that will be helpful for this lesson, review some old vocab, and practice some of the terms. <coughs> and then we're going to discuss a little bit about Harriet Beecher Stowe, um, her novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, and then time permitting, doing an activity or two with her. And so I'm going to pass out a worksheet. This will be your homework, technically, but we should be able to do it in class. So those are going to be the activities we're doing today. First thing, vocab. Our first vocab word is the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, defined as a law that required the U.S. government to actively assist slave owners in recapturing their slaves. So before this law of a slave escaped, um, sympathetic people were allowed to help them to freedom. But once this law was passed, it made it illegal for people to help slaves escape. Um, so now if a person was caught, they were obligated to return them to the master. The next vocab word is civil disobedience, which is defined as peacefully refusing to obey unjust laws rather than protesting with violence. And we're going to see some of that in Harry Beecher Stowe's um, purpose for her book. She wanted to encourage others to help people, um, help runaway slaves by practicing civil disobedience because she felt the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was unjust. We're going to talk about um, abolitionist, which is a person who wanted to end slavery. And then our last new vocab word is controversy, which is a dispute concerning a matter of opinion. So some controversies today would be like gun laws or immigration or who was right, Taylor Swift or Kanye West, that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about reviewing primary and secondary sources. The primary source, as you know, is defined as an immediate first-hand account from people who are involved. So can anyone give me an example of a primary source? Yes, a diary. Yes, very good. Um, and a secondary source, which is not directly involved, but often adds an interpretation of a primary source. Do you have an example? Yes, a biography. Very good. Okay, <laughs> so our next thing we're going to review some of these vocab words, primary secondary sources, that's going to be one of our activities. So I'm just going to read these off, go down the line, and then you're going to answer whether you think it's primary or secondary. Starting with Alex, a news report about the opening of a power plant, primary or secondary? Primary. Good. Okay. Taylor, the musical Hamilton. Secondary. Kyle, the diary of Benjamin Franklin. Uh, primary. Um, Brielle, the Declaration of Independence. Primary. Emily, a photo of a plantation. Primary. A YouTube video describing the war. Secondary. Okay. An interview with Alexander Graham Bell about how he invented the telephone. Primary. And then a textbook explaining reconstruction. Secondary. And the last one's a little bit trickier, so we're going to take a vote. If you think that Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe is a primary source, raise your hand. Secondary source, raise your hand. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I don't know what it's like a primary source as like a, to the story of slavery or to like the story of abolitionism. Or, um, uh, <laughs> why, why would you say secondary source? 
because it isn't a true account mm -hmm. and it isn't her story. She's telling a fictional story that isn't based in her own experience, but in the experience of others. Good point. And someone that said primary source? Oh, you mm -hmm. could use it as a primary source. Like, yeah, you, if you're talking about the abolitionist movement, I feel Yeah, because like it was written source. in that time period, yeah. Yeah. which is a big mm -hmm. So that's the complex factor behind certain primary and secondary sources. I would say it's a primary source because it was written in the time, yeah. and because it's like a reflection out of what people at that time thought. So we're going to move on to talk about Harriet Beecher Stowe and her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which had some strong ties to the Civil War. Her book about slavery fanned the flames between pro-slavery advocates and anti-slavery advocates. Um, it sparked discussions about or between the two groups, which led or was so much, or the discussions were so much more powerful after this book that when Abraham Lincoln met her, he reportedly said to her that she was the little lady who started this great war. Mm -hmm. um, her book attracted thousands of readers to the abolitionist cause with her depiction of slavery. Harriet Beecher Stowe was born in 1811 in Connecticut. She was one of seven kids. Her father was Lyman Beecher, who was a minister. He had strong beliefs about the importance of education, so he believed that everyone should have an education, including women. So sons and daughters alike, he educated his kids, which was kind of a rarity for 19th century women. Um, he was also really popular for his anti-slavery sermons and activities, which influenced Beecher's life growing up. Um, when she was about 21, they moved to Ohio, where she helped support her family by working as a writer. She wrote for several free articles and became pretty well-known. Um, she eventually married and had kids of her own. She was inspired to write Uncle Tom's Cabin actually after a cholera outbreak in 1849. 3,000 people died, including her son which said inspired sympathy for enslaved mothers who lost their kids being torn apart from slavery. And it's also inspired by the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which upset her and many other Northerners. Um, this law required Northerners to return runaway slaves to their owners, and she wrote this to inspire readers to defy this law and act of civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. So, this was Originally written for a newspaper, it was supposed to be over a few weeks, she was writing a little story, but she actually missed one of the deadlines, and so a bunch of people wrote into the newspaper, like, hey, what happened to the story, like, we want to know what happens, and so she was convinced by the publisher to turn it into a novel. Um, this wasn't the first anti-slavery story, but it was one of the most popular and most influential in the first week. It was published in 18... 52, it sold 10,000 copies, and then within a year, it sold 300,000 copies. After this, she published a book called The Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, and it was just all her sources from um, various places like narratives of Frederick Douglass or Josiah Henderson for former slaves. Um, this book sparked controversy then because the deal was with slavery, to keep it or not. So pro-slavery advocates thought that this was an extreme case, and they wanted to, um, so they wrote their own stories based off her Uncle Tom's Cabin, and instead of showing slavery as a bad institution, they tried to make it look like a benevolent institution. And then anti-slavery advocates praised her work for um, showing the reality of slavery. And even today, there's some controversy between or how um, this affects how people today see slavery. And she is kind of criticized for her stereotypes of African Americans, which we'll discuss in the next unit. Um, and yeah. So just an overview of the plot. We're gonna actually read some section or some passages in the next section, but just an overview. Um, it's about Tom, a slave, who was in Kentucky, his wife and kids, 
and despite having a good relationship with his master, he was forced um, to be sold away from his family, and it just kind of covers his story as he goes from plantation to plantation and the people he meets, and despite his like good character, he is never viewed as an equal, and his experiences in that, ultimately, I'll feel by like, the main um, plot hole, or plot, he does die <laughs> um, after he helps some of his friends escape slavery at a plantation, and he is ultimately beaten to death. And when his first master hears what happened to Tom, he realizes the ultimate evils of slavery and ends up freeing all his slaves. Another point in this story is um, how a mother and her son run away from a slave owner, and they try and escape to Canada. And she talks a lot about how abolitionists helped her escape to Canada, and I think this was um, her encouraging civil disobedience. These people who helped harbor and transport slaves to freedom were breaking the law, but she believed that the Fugitive Slave Act was, was unjust, and so it shouldn't be followed. In her conclusion, um, Stowe writes about why she wrote the book and what she thought of slavery. She refers to herself as the writer, um, and she discusses with the reader her arguments of slavery. So I'll read this out loud, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. The writer has given only a faint shadow, a dim picture of the anguish and despair that are at this very moment writhing thousands of hearts. Writhing means splitting apart violently. Shattering thousands of families and driving a helpless and sensitive race to frenzy and despair. There are those who know the mothers from this accursed traffic has driven to the murder of their children and themselves seeking in death a shelter from woes more dreaded than death. And you, mothers of America, I beseech you, pity the mother who has all your affections and not one legal right to protect, guide, or educate the child of her bosom. I beseech you, pity those mothers that are constantly made childless by the American slave trade, and say, mothers of America, is this a thing to be defended, sympathized with, passed over in silence? Do you say that people are free state, have nothing to do with it, and can do nothing? Would to God this were true, but it is not true. The people of the free states have defended, encouraged, and participated, and are more guilty for it before God in the South, and that they have not the apology of education or custom. If the mothers of the free states had all felt as they should, in times past, the sons of the free states would not have been the holders, and proverbially the hardest masters of slaves. You pray for the heathen abroad, pray also for the heathen at home, and pray for the distressed Christians whose whole chance of religious improvement is an accident of trade and sale from whom any adherence to the morals of Christianity is, in many cases, an impossibility, unless they have given them from above the courage and grace of martyrdom. So work with your neighbor, or individually, and try to work through this sometimes confusing language, and summarize your argument in your own words, bullet points are fine. I'll give you a minute or two to do that. So, what do you think her main argument against slavery is? I feel like 
the under, like, it focuses so much on Christianity and the fact that it's inhibiting the ability to, to develop religiously, and then that's therefore a reflection on the free states and their roles as Christians as well. Okay, smart eighth grader. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> yes? Um, there's a lot on motherhood mm -hmm. and, like, the... I don't know, slavery is inhibiting mothers from raising their children or even having children. Which was kind of my next question. Who do you think the writer is writing to? Mm -hmm. And then what do you think she's asking the reader to do? I think she's almost appealing to like an instinct or like common sense. Like mothers, I shouldn't even have to explain to you what I'm trying to explain. Like you should know that what's going on is not good. Yeah, very good. That kind of ties into my next slide really well, actually. Thank you. I'll read this for you. This is also in her conclusion, and then she's talking about why she wrote the book. She says, for many years of her life, the author avoided all reading upon or allusion to the subject of slavery, considering it as too painful to be inquired into, and one which advancing life and civilization would certainly live down. But since the legislative act of 1850, when she heard with perfect surprise and consternation, Christian and humane people actually recommending the remaining escaped fugitives into slavery as a duty binding on good citizens, when she heard on all hands from kind, compassionate, and estimable people in the free states of the North, deliberations and discussions as to what Christian duty could be on this head, she could only think, these men and Christians cannot know what slavery is, for if they did, such a question could never be open for discussion. And from this arose a desire to exhibit it in living, dramatic reality. So, kind of like Kyle said, this was like um, kind of playing into. She thought that slavery was going to go away because it was such an obviously bad institution that she believed. But she started to realize that with the Fugitive Slave Act, that it wasn't going away. It was, in fact, getting worse. So she was hoping through this book to show the readers the horrible reality of slavery and show them that it needed to be stopped. Does anyone remember from our vocab? I know we just learned it, but what the Fugitive Slave Act did. People had to return their slaves mm -hmm. or escape slaves. Like so she said she ignored slavery because she thought it was too painful to talk about. She didn't want to think about it. And it was so obviously bad that it was going on its own. And, but because slavery was illegal in the North, many Northerners just ignored it until the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 made it their business to become involved. And for us, that seems like a bad idea. We're in the future, we know better, right? Um, but that actually does happen in history. Like for example, with the rise of Nazi Germany, Americans ignored that because it's not my business, don't want to get involved. And so for Monday, I would like, I'm going to bring in a headline from a current newspaper of a worldwide issue that Americans are ignoring today. We're going to be <laughs> discussing that in class. So just a review for next time, bring in the newspaper article. Um, journal check is next Tuesday, and we'll be finishing chapter 14 this week.